Guillermo Adriana, uh, escritor, ¿verdad? actor, uh, maestro universitario y de profesión uh, escritor. Aquí lo tienen con ustedes, al señor Guillermo Adriana. Un aplauso. <laughs> so, I'm going to stand up. I thought I was going to see everyone, but why I, I, I want you to see this before having this conversation. First, because I would like to talk about the craft of filmmaking, and then I would like to address some of the things that this uh, short film touches, which I think is uh, important. Um, most of these actors have never been to a cinema in their lives. This man has never been out of his village ever. Uh, the farthest he has been is 10 miles away from his village. He spent all of his life in the same village. He doesn't know how to write and read. Um, He's been working hard all his life, and uh, even though he hasn't been out ever, his grandson is an anchor in Miami. This very poor man, one of his sons went to the States, and now the grandson is a very important anchor in a major Miami TV station. And this is one of the nicest persons you can ever meet in your life. All of these people is really nice. The why I celebrate the 100 years of Mexican Revolution and Independence with this short film? Because a way of celebrating is not always being cheerful, is to acknowledge who you are. I think that one way of celebrating who you are is accepting exactly who the person you are or who the country you are and to acknowledge that every single war, every single conflict brings indirectly or directly innocent victims. We just have an ideal boy killed four days ago in Boston. He's a victim of these wars. It's very painful. 
Does he have something to do with it? Does he know where Chechenia is? Does he know what the Muslims want? To? No idea. And this hurts us because it's close to us, but I, I, I'm sure that in, in Chechenia there's also people who are like kids who are killed without knowing. So, in order to understand, in order to understand who we are, I am like this. Celebrating for me is not only, oh yeah, Mexico, being nationalistic, but being real. And right now, Mexico is suffering a war against the drug cartels. I was saying this to, to I haven't been saying this to American students. I know that here in, in, in Oregon, they locally grow marijuana. But not everywhere. Shh. A lot of marijuana comes from Mexico. And in order that the kid has a good time, my fellow countrymen and fellow countrywomen, they are being killed. So, we have begun to understand how interconnected we are now in, 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 in the world. And how every step we give have a, a reverberation that in some way affects someone else, maybe thousands of kilometers away, which is the intention of a film I did called Bubble. In Bubble, two kids, two dog kids in Morocco, not believing, believing that a 306 caliber can reach five miles, they began shooting cars to see if it was true or not. And they hit a tourist bus. These are kids 11 and 12, which comes from my own experience. At 12, I was hunting in the desert, and a friend of mine said, Ah, this is not true. These bullets will not reach five miles. And he was almost shooting me. He was almost going to shoot a car. That's where it comes from. So these stupid kids hurt someone with this stupidity, and that has reverberations that go all the way to the Mexican desert. How? Because now we are together, every human being. Um, Ronald Reagan and, and Margaret Thatcher, they pushed hardly to erase all the borders, economic borders, to the free trade. We even signed a free trade with the United States and Canada called the NAFTA. The idea is that all the products should go free. No taxes, no restrictions to commerce. But, but, if you have that free trade, you have to be intelligent enough to know that it will be also a trade of people. People is going to move and migrate with the products, which is what's been happening. If you want to know why Eugene Oregon has too many Mexicans, the route is in 1981, 1982, when Reagan pushed to have a corporate America that was the idea behind the economics of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan was to have very strong economic um, institutions, corporations, and they would spread job below. And, and wealth. But what happened is that Walmart grew up and all the pop and mom business went down. We can see that I, I've been traveling, I travel all Oregon, mostly, especially in the coast, making a scout for the for the brain trade. And um, there's a Walmart everywhere. There's the same restaurants. The same restaurants I have seen in the Rio, Texas and Las Cruces, New Mexico are here. McDonald's, Starbucks, Subway. So in certain way, I can tell you because I, I saw it, many Mexican farmers, they were, there was an economic tsunami. <laughs> they were swept by the economy. And they have no, no, no chance of 
provocating themselves. What happened with Mexico is that the wealth concentrated a lot, and instead of spreading jobs, it created 10 of the most rich men in the world. We have the richest men in the world in Mexico. And 52% of the, the, uh, the, uh, the people in Mexico lives below the line of poverty. These people have no escape. And I can tell you that 99.9% .9 of these people is, the, is extremely nice and extremely generous and extremely... Solidarity is very important for these people. So, I understand Americans. I understand that many Americans are angry that suddenly these bunch of foreigners who doesn't speak the language, who doesn't follow the culture, which even have a very strange religion, because for many, Catholicism is a strange religion. <laughs> I heard it in Fox, no, really, I heard it in Fox News. <laughs> Fox News I saw three guys debating if Santoro was a real Christian or not. And one of them said, a Catholic is not a Christian. They have these witches and things and saints and angels. It's very strange. They say the same about Mick Romney. He's not a real Christian. But there's people in Fox News who just see is very liberal. They were discussing <laughs> the religiosity and the Christianity of the Catholics and the Mormons. So, I understand perfectly Americans. It, it should be very painful to see that. You know, Tom and Peter and some of these, these Luis and Pedro, who are these guys? <laughs> Pedro? And they have very strange names like Arriaga. <laughs> or Morales. <laughs> it's right. It's right. It's right to be angry. It's right to be upset. Many of them are here in Italy. It's right. It's perfectly right. It's perfectly right to deny uh, licenses, to deny social security, to put walls. It's your country. You can deny everything to to whoever you want. But the United States is the leader of the world and generosity of this country, which I have been part of this generosity, which I'm very thankful because part of this generosity is you being here. They have to show their way and say, okay, they are illegal, but they are here for a reason. They are here because something happened in the world that provoked provoked that all of these guys come here. This is a reality. It's, a, it's an economic reality because you need the workforce of the Mexicans and the Central Americans, and you need Koreans in the convenience stores, and you need Indians. You need them. So there's two, two options. Or we still fight against it, or we show, or you show as Americans, where generosity comes from, and become a country that shows how leadership has to be, and leadership is to be human. I will not get angry or upset if anyone in any state denies anything to an illegal Mexican, because it's your law, it's your country, and you have all the right to do it. But you will give a great, 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 huge lesson to the world if you act humanely. If you say, this man is strange, I don't like him, but let's see why he's here. I would like to understand who he is. That's what it's my work about. That's what I'm trying to do. That every person, everyone has a, has a life, and it's important to someone. And that importance has to be acknowledged. Has to be acknowledged. Yesterday I was telling, telling another, in another conference, in another lecture, that we are living the objectivization of society. When we began thinking of other people as objects, then terrorism has a purpose. I, I, I meet mean with terrorists. I know you have a chance to talk to terrorists. I haven't, I haven't been able to, to talk to a guy who was the one who planted the bombs in Colombia. 
it was one of the most eerie experiences of, of my life. Listen to a terrorist saying, okay, I put the bombs, I kill these kids. Poor kids. You hunt, isn't it? Poor dear. I say, well, kind of different. No, it's the same. I have a political purpose, these guys went away, bad luck. I, I, I wanted to kill the guy. It's like these kids, they were objects. So when we began feeling that the other people is an object, we, ourselves, became objects. And the great lesson is that everyone has to be a subject. Everyone is a person. My friend Mercedes Estrada, my friend Pedro Estrada, I, I wrote a novel and I wrote a movie about, not about them, but I put their names to, to the characters. Mercedes Estrada is a friend of mine. Since I hunt a lot and I am not rich, I go and hunt with poor farmers who allow me to hunt in their lands. Mercedes Estrada doesn't know how to read, doesn't know how to write, and he came here to the States. He has been here for 20 years illegal. And he was telling me the other day, and he has long, long, long conversations with the owner of the milk farm where he works in. And he doesn't speak a word of English, and he doesn't speak a word of Spanish. <laughs> but Ben told you know, he, these guys has had grandsons, and there's a will to understand each other. We can understand each other. The way of understanding terrorism, for example, is to understand the reasons of the terrorist. What is behind the terrorist mind? Behind the terrorist line is the idea that I feel like an object. So the rest will be objects. The day we began having a conversation between us and seeing who is beside us, I think that is the way to approach things. So, to the authorities of Oregon, someone here is authority. It's perfectly okay for us Mexicans if you want to deny education, if you want to deny uh, licenses, if you want to deny social security or doctors to any illegal Mexican. It's your right and I'm okay with it. The problem is if you are okay with it. You feel it's fair, not for us, but for you. If it's fair that I treat these people like shit, will that make me a better person? No. It makes me a better person to embrace these people and say, okay man, you are here legally. Let's see why you are here. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit, a little bit about filmmaking. I've been working with the best actors in the world, very fortunate. Among the best actors or actresses I have witnessed and I have the pleasure to work with Jennifer Lawrence. She was 17 years old when I worked with her, and I, 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 I wrote her a letter when we finished shooting the rain, then I say, be prepared. Be prepared because you're going to win at least 12 Oscars in your life. <laughs> you can make you become the most important actress of this century. But I, know, I, I, I have also worked with a guy like this. He had no idea of acting. No idea. These kids have no idea of acting. And it was funny. When I was shooting, if they were not talking, they were distracted. They didn't, they didn't realize that they were on the frame. So they were like, the actor was saying this is line ski finish, and he was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you're in the scene. Yeah, but I'm not finished. No, no, they're here. Okay. It's, it's fun. And this man, 
told me, I don't cry. We Mexicans, we don't cry. I mean, I don't cry, first. I belong to that generation that doesn't cry and doesn't do speak. And we still consider dogs, dogs. No barbies. So this man told me, I do not cry. And look, he cried. And he cried like a baby for half an hour. Mm -hmm. We directors, we have to be mean. Sometimes. We have to be funny. Sometimes. But we have always to push the right button to the actor to make him react to what we are wanting. Sometimes I ask for permission to the actor. How deep can I go in your pain? Sometimes they say, don't go there because I can't. So I ask this man, how deep can I go in your pain? Say, ah, I'm a top guy. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you how I make him cry. He has 12 kids, 7 daughters and 5 sons. He has like a bunch of grandchildren. There are so many I forgot how many they are. And he has like 20 grand grandchildren. And um, I invited the whole family the day he was going to cry. <laughs> 73 of them. <laughs> 73. And they were all like, he was acting, it was when he was showing it, and they were like, ah, daddy, daddy. <laughs> you know? And he, he portrayed the pain, and he was like, <laughs> he had no idea of what's going on. I, I was just telling him, dig, put this face, now, this. He had no idea what, was, what, what it was about. Okay? He was beginning to realize, I didn't give him the screenplay. He doesn't know how to read, so it was a purpose of reading the screenplay. So, the, uh, the DP, who was also the producer, was like, he nuts. You have all these bunch of noisy Mexicans there, and you want to shoot the painful scene at the end? Yeah. You'll see. Okay? So, I told the DP, are you ready to shoot? Shoot what? He's gonna cry. Oh yeah, sure. He's gonna cry. Be prepared. Okay. So I call the family. Hey guys, come here! And they were like 15 yards away. I say, stop right there, please. So I put my arm around Mr. Umberto, Don Umberto, and say, my friend, you are dying. You are old. This is maybe your last month or your last year of life. It's a fact. Death is here. Whisper. Breathing and breathing. Okay? You know it's the moment to say goodbye. Now, look what you did. That is where you're gonna live in planet Earth. All of that, all of that love you brought, all of that people who love each other, that's you. Now, please close your eyes. That's going to be the last image you're going to have of what you did in this world. And I said it out. And I, they, I said, don't, don't open your eyes. When he opened, they were hidden and everything was the vast desert and I, he began crying and I said, man, I don't cry, but I don't cry for you <laughs> and I began crying with him and suddenly, like if I have opened something, he began crying and crying and crying and crying and crying the DP was crying, the crew was crying <laughs> everyone was crying because it was a very touching moment so, 
We say cut, he hugged me and cried and cried and said, I don't want to die, I want my family, you are right, this is what I'm living, I'm living a world full of love. I said, okay, don't get me wrong. <laughs> he said that he wasn't going to cry. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this guy had never been to, to, uh, to out of town, his village. So we were selected to compete in the, the Men's Film Festival, which is a side with can the two of the most prestigious. And I called him and said, the Humberto, we have been selected. We are on the official competition in Cannes, in Venice. Or I would like you to come. We will invite you. Say, can I be here in the afternoon? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. It's because, you know, um, I have my kid has three cows. I have my cows and no one's going to take care of them. I'll pay somewhere. No, 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 no. How many days? <coughs> well, it's like, it takes like a day to get there. A day? <laughs> no. No, 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 no. How much to return? Another day? No, 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 no. <laughs> and you know, my wife always takes me the, the breakfast to bed. <laughs> and she's not gone, so I'm not gone. Perfect. <laughs> Next day I have like, calls from 30 of his family. He's going! He's going! Of course he's going! Okay, so I have to bring his wife, bring him, and bring his daughter, and bring someone that will take care of him. Of course they were stopped in Paris with a bag full of cheese. <laughs> And the French were like, you cannot pass it. Why? They are my chilies. <laughs> and he was very offended that they were taking away his chilies. <laughs> and his salsa, he has, he had bags with, with salsa lately. Okay. So he arrives to Venice. First time he takes a, a flight. First time he goes out, he's done, imagine, going to Venice. First time he goes to the cinema. And he's in the cinema, this man, and there's 2,000 people from all over the world. And he's sitting there like a cowboy, <laughs> with his hat, his, you know, because he's a cowboy. <laughs> and uh, by the way, he left me deaf. I'm going to tell you I'm deaf on this because he was, he's responsible for dying deaf. I'll tell you why. So, we screamed. El Pozo de World, which he hasn't have an idea what it was about. And when it finishes, he's crying like a baby again. <laughs> he has so girlish, so baby, or so boyish, I don't want to be a matcher. And he's crying and crying and crying, and she said, I couldn't kill the kid. He's down. I said, yeah, that's what it was about. No, it's down. And we have a standing ovation. Ten minutes of a standing ovation. And I say, Don Beto, that's for you, not for, not for me, that's for you, so stand up. So he stands up and he begins like. <laughs>
fried eggs. <laughs> fried, fried eggs. And so it has, it has no, no taste, no chili, no salsa. And then he became very popular. He had the right of his life. When the governor took, uh, how do you say, uh, from opposition, took possession. <laughs> When he took possession, he was invited. And now there's a new scene where he's from, with we screen this and he gives talks about it. Why I'm deaf? Because I say, okay, Mr. Romero, I'm going to show you how to act. I have a girl. Slap her in, the, in, in her face. This is a man this big. With the hands, imagine a, a, a man who has worked all of his life. It's like, you saw them with the hands, isn't it? The fingers are this big. <laughs> and she slapped the girl. She says, mm. No, slap her. <laughs> no, she said, like a woman. Okay, slap me. He didn't slap me. He hit me with his full hand. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, I have a tinnitus. It's like, Tru! and, it, and it's, and it's, and it's videotaped. My friends want to post it on YouTube and I say I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have always have to find the way to bring, to pull the, the emotion from someone. To try to make it real. That's our job. My job as a writer is also to try to make feel that even the most depictable People who despise have something inside them that make you understand them. Maybe not love them, but understand them. I wrote first a film called Amores Pelos. Amores Pelos is a guy who's 18 years old who wants to steal the wife of his brother, who is the mother of his kid, and is pregnant of the other kid. And he wants to rob the girl from his brother. In order to rob the girl from his brother, he, ha he goes and fights his dog to make money, to have money to steal her. Is he depictable? Do you despise this kid? Of course. But I want you to understand who he is and why he acts like that. <coughs> then I have a hitman who's surrounded by dogs, all the time surrounded by dogs. And he goes and kills people. And in the end, you have to understand that this murderer even has some hint of humanity, some touch of humanity. So, and here in Oregon, I shot a film about a woman who sleeps with every man that crosses her path. She's a serial sex killer. No, she doesn't kill anyone. She has sex with everyone. <laughs> <laughs> serial sex, what would you say? Addict. Sex addict. <laughs> it's not even sex addict. Because she's not addicted to sex. She's addicted to hurt herself. And sex without any purpose, it becomes a way of hurting herself. So she's having sex without pleasure. She's having sex because she's so lonely and she's so hurt that she needs someone to show her that she's still alive. But we immediately began judging. We love to judge people. And as a writer, we have to avoid judging people. Because my, my, I'm not a moral, I, I don't want to be moralistic. I want to be understanding, which is completely different. Moralistic people, sometimes they lose the importance of the human being they have in front of them. And Mario Vargas Llosa, which is a, a writer that I really like, and which I think is a, a great human being, he wrote a book and said, the moment a novelist judges his character, the moment the novelist becomes a bad writer. So, if I, as a novelist, or arrive as a filmmaker or screenwriter, uh, 
make you think that that person that I am judging is not that bad, that there's some hint of humanity, then I began building bridges between human beings. Art will never ever give answers. It's not our purpose to give answers. Our purpose is to raise questions. I want you, when you read one of my books or you see one of my films, to have a question, a personal question. I always say that reading a book or watching a film or, or even watching a painting or, or a choreography or something is that if I'm watching in that direction all the time and after that I read the book, it slowly moves me and I see something completely different. I've been giving some lectures to 11-year-old kids about the importance of reading. The first thing I do is I give them a list of books and I tell them they are prohibited. <laughs> Please don't let your parents know you are reading it. <laughs> you can be severely punished. You will read things that... Nah. <laughs> So they, I, 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 I say, don't, 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 I, I'm almost worried that I'm giving you this list. Because it's, oh man, so secret what is inside those pages. <laughs> and guess what? 30 days later, all of them told me, I read it! You were right! My parents will kill me if they know! <laughs> it was a Bible, but that's what you <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> so, and I, I told them, you know something? What has really hurt my generation is to see people who died before dying. I see them, they walk. I'm not telling about poor people who have no options in life. I'm telling your parents who have middle class, they have options. But they don't have that God to go for them. They don't have the strength, they don't have the belief. They don't. And you know why, kids, these people are dead? Because they, didn't, they never knew who they were. The great tragedy of someone is never knowing who you are. Since you don't know who you are, how are you going to have a goal? Which goal are you going to have if you don't know where to head? Because you don't know who you are. And people don't know who they are because they don't have interior life. We're always out of ourselves, not in ourselves. There's this whole generation that wants to be superficial. At least in Mexican kids, everything has to be superficial. In Mexico, they even have this expression, no de claves, don't go deep. Don't go deep, no, 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 that's too deep for me. Everything has to be shallow. If everything is shallow, there's a moment where you don't know who you are. We are lacking interior life. Now we live in a, in, a, in a world full of screens. Everything has to do with the screen. We are touching. We are losing the touch with real human beings. I have seen my students because I've been a college professor for many years. They are chatting with a beautiful girl in a mall in San Antonio, Texas, and the beautiful girls behind them are walking behind them. Turn, turn. Really? So, reading and watching things that go beyond entertainment allows to know who we are. I have no patience. If I don't like the book, I throw it away. In page 30. It's, this, is, this is not a punishment. <laughs> Reading is, is a way of finding yourself. If you're not finding yourself quick in that book, bye. When I was a student, they always told me, you have to read this book and this book and this book. I began reading and said, they're not telling me something. So I went to the teacher and say, you know something, I didn't read these ones, but I read these ones. I got an A plus because I say that. 
Because of each and single of them, they want to understand Sayyidina. So I, don't, I tell kids, you have to read kids. Why? Because reading will allow you to understand who you are. There's books and mirrors. Mirrors of yourself. Stand up the great French writer saying, books are mirrors of your road. And sometimes I, I don't know what's on my back. But I grab a book, and there's a mirror, and I see what's on my back. And maybe an enemy is coming. And the only way to understand that an enemy is coming, or a friend is coming, is reading a book. Because it's a mirror of something. Books is the experience of someone put in pages. And we get rich if we have the experience of everyone. And when, and, 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 and I, when, I always say to my students, you want to be updated to the very top, go to the classics. The Greeks, Shakespeare, Rulfo, William Faulkner, they had a clue to who we are. We understand who we are through reading. So that's why I always tell kids, read if you want to be someone alive. Experience life. Not everyone has a chance to experience life. The other day I made some, some I have a lecture, and I say that contemporary cinema is projecting or expressing the boredom of contemporary human beings. You can see, I go to festivals, I'm part of Jewish festivals. The language is slow. Wait, I have to get there. <laughs> language is slow. What happens to these characters is boring. Is that bad art? No. Jane Austen, the great writer, she wrote about how bored she was and she wrote masterpieces. The Bronte sisters. They were Flaubert. Anna Karenina. Bored people who want to leave because they, they are constrained. One of the best things that someone told me ever, ever, is a woman, a girl, she was going to get married. And she read one of my novels and she said, I cancel my wedding. <laughs> Why? Because I was going to be proud like that woman with a man I don't love. And I didn't realize I was in love until I saw this woman of loving the man. She's married. And I was walking like a rat to the trap, directly to the non-love marriage. I have seen I have seen beautiful letters. One letter was sent me by a man in Belgium. He said, I am uh, I cannot move my, my legs anymore. I'm 73. I'm dying. But I want to say that your books are allowing me to die in peace. Because those books are allowing me to see who I am through your work. Which is, for a writer, is more moving than having a great review in the New York Times. I have, I don't know why my books are so popular in prisons. <laughs> they love the prisons. This, this short, won the award for best short film in a competition decided by a jury of prisoners, of inmates. And a man wrote me from a jail in Brazil and told me, your, your, your novel that I do for this man is the favorite here. But it's only one, and we are fighting. Can you send more? <laughs> the same happened in Twitter. A guy wrote me and said, I have just came out of prison. I spent many years in prison. I can tell you that your books helped me be free. So you never know when you write who you are, whose life you are touching. And you don't know when you read which part of those lives are touching you. I don't think that my books are suitable for everyone. Maybe it's completely boring and you will throw them away, which will happen most of the time. I don't mind. You are in your right. 
By the way, I spent five years writing a novel. Of those five years, I write 10 to 14 hours every day, including Sundays. And the other day, a guy told me, Wow, I read your book in two hours. <laughs> <laughs> You can reach the five years. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. I'm still three years away. <laughs> so please give me your two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Kafka said that art is a way of fighting death. I don't know if you believe in God or not, but the only thing that is certain beyond faith, is this life. We don't have, we are not sure. We want to believe, and we believe because of faith, but not, we're not certain that we have no life. We have only this life. So God can say, the only thing to defeat your own death is to create something that will survive you. So art and writing is a way of surviving ourselves. There is a tribe in Africa, the Bantu, the are pygmies. They say, you don't die until your name stops of being pronounced. If they pronounce your name, you're still alive. The Dani, which is a, a, a tribe from, from the um, South Islands, close to Australia, they cut this finger of a girl. So every time you see that girl, you will remind, you will remember, sorry, a dead man or woman. So we have all this need to go beyond ourselves. What are we doing to go beyond ourselves? I just gave a talk to, to kids, Latino kids. By the way, I hate the word Latino kids. Like, I hate the word Latino because we are not Latino. We are Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Peruvians, Colombians. We are not a bunch of guys. <laughs> there are no whites. We are from Polish descent, from Swedish descent. So, I think these Latinos are really Americans. That's it. But I told them, and I will ask you, can you please wash your hands? If you are so kind. Please wash your hands. <coughs> Joe, wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash them. Please wash them. Do you wash them? Okay, now that you are watching them, guess what? These Hands, sooner or later, will become the hands of a corpse. They will be the hands of a cavalry. What have you done with your hands? Have you done something with your hands that you are proud of? I was telling the kids, sometimes in your hands, they began to hurt because you were not Courageous enough to stop that bully from bullying me. I'm not an advocate of violence, but sometimes you need to stop a bully. And a kid, 15, who doesn't stop a bully, for example, he will feel like a coward the rest of his life. He will say, Why I didn't stop him? I have seen him with guys my age. They are defeated from those that age because they didn't have the power. Of course, this huge guy 
will allow you. And many people now with the with the with the uh, uh, social I call it uh, with the social Twitter and Facebook, they will need it. You have to do something with your hands. That's why I become a writer. I was once I was having a, a, a roommate and he was going to the Olympic Games. He was in the rowing team and I was like, man, I want to go to the Olympics. I said, well, it's a little bit late to be part of the basketball team. <laughs> okay. It's late to play soccer in the national team. Uh, swimming. But I was used to fight in a neighborhood where you have to fight every day. And I said, well, Mexicans, my size and my weight, there are not many. I'll try to go as a heavyweight to the Olympics. So I began fighting. I'm going to fight him. Well, what's the reason? <laughs> and I was training, and suddenly I began feeling pain in my heart. Here. I said, like, oh man, this is painful. I didn't pay attention to it. I continued training because I really want to go to the Olympics. And it hurt again. And again, and again. And I went to a doctor when I was feeling very bad and he says, you have a small torn in your um, plexus, in the muscle, which is hurting you. You can train, don't worry. Just don't make too many push-ups. I trained, and that night, I felt a cat biting me here, running to my left arm, my hand, was completely um, numb. I was like, what's happening? I almost, uh, it was difficult for me to stand up from the bed. I told my mom, uh, I called her from, I was living by myself with this woman, saying, can you and my dad come pick me up and take me to the hospital? I'm feeling really, really bad. So I go to the cardiologist. And the cardiologist tells me, I have a good news and bad news. The good news is you're not hypochondriac. <laughs> <laughs> the bad news is that you have a mild infection that if you take care of it, it does, nothing happens like hepatitis. It's called pericarditis. Your, the, the pericardium is infected, and because you didn't take care now, your muscle is infected. So you're on the verge of a heart attack. So there's nothing to be very, there's nothing to do. We will put you with aspirins to try to stop how swollen it is. And resist. You cannot stand to the bathroom, you cannot talk somewhere more than five minutes. And they see you can make it this night because it's completely swollen in your heart. But you're not in the <laughs> My doctor, so nice. <laughs> So that night I, I watched my hands. And I say, maybe tomorrow there will be the hands of the horse. That's when I realized I was, I was in the chance. I was not close to die, but there was a possibility. So I have to do something with those hands, with these hands. And since I was a kid, I always wanted to be a writer, but I lacked, I, and at some moment I lost myself, because even knowing who you are, you can lost yourself. But it was like the heart telling me, don't stop wherever you were heading. From that day <coughs> until like three years ago, I wrote non-stop. I said, I had to do something with my hands. I had to do something with my hands. I write my first book. I write four books. Of those four, only one is published. I don't care. I was. I didn't care if I was going to be published or not. I didn't care if I was going to be uh, famous or not. I had this need to leave something behind me. Someone that would present my life. And that's why I become a writer. And that's why I haven't stopped writing. And uh, it took some time to be published. But I didn't stop writing. That, that didn't stop me. Because it was, it was the travel of writing what I was enjoying. 
I was fortunate enough that those books were published, that those books are now are translated in many languages, that those books were bought to make films about them, and that those books allowed me to write original screenplay that were films that <coughs> some of them, of, of them you have seen. But we have to do something with our hands. Sometimes maybe it's not writing, it's helping someone else. It's creating fair circumstances to the other people. Educating. I come from a family, my, 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 my parents always told me, you have to leave the world much better than you found it. And education is one of the ways of doing so. Forget about making tons of money. My, my parents never were worried if we were going to be rich or poor. They were concerned if we were going to fulfill our dreams or not. Which is different from being rich or not. And um, my father was a teacher, my mother was a teacher, and the four of us, we have been teachers. And we love the sense that we help students find the best of themselves. That's the goal of a teacher. Who you are, kid, and what's the best of you? What are your talents? By the way, you know where the word talent comes from? Anyone here knows? Talent was a coin. Um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Romans. And when someone did something well, they paid them talent. So having talent is having money <laughs> in your wallet because of the things you did. That's where the word talent comes. You know where the word murder comes from? Everyone knows where the word murder comes from. There's a pack of wolves, there's a flock of geese, there's a colony of quail, and there's a murder of crows. Because a group of crows killed a crow that, don't, that didn't belong to their group, that's where the word murder comes. The word assassin. Where the word assassin comes from? In the Arab countries, six, seven hundred years ago, there was a sect who smoked hashish. They were called the Hashashins. Since they were high in hashish, you hired them to murder people. So they say, there comes a Hashashin, the smoker of hashish. I have a lot of words. <laughs> I'm a writer and I'm obsessed with words. Sirloin. The sirloin is a, a king loved so much a, 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 a kind of, of meat cup that he said, I declare you sir. And the sir will loin. That's true. The laugh is true. So, about writing. So writing is a way of defeating them. I had my studio full of skulls of many materials. Many people think that I am obsessed with that. No, I'm obsessed with life. And I have those skulls because every time I go to my studio, my working place tired, I see the skulls and I say, Ariaga, you're going to die. But your work is going to be. So you better work. And I work hard. Yeah. And even if I'm tired or I'm coming from a wedding or I'm coming from a party or I'm on vacation, I have to write. Because that's my chance to present. That's my chance to make a purpose in my life. Even, even if the book it's not going to be published. Many people ask me, young writers, give me an advice. Just, they just ask me, give me an advice. And who asked me? Is here? Who asked me? A few minutes ago? Okay, it's not here. But he asked me, give me an advice to my students who want to write. Never stop. Never, ever stop. 
And don't think that inspiration is something important. Inspiration is not important. Discipline is important. Inspiration is part of the, of the work. But I hate these procrastinators say, I'm waiting for the muses. <laughs> no, man, you don't wait for the muses. You go and hunt them. You bring them from the woods and come on! <laughs> you seduce them. You, you do anything you can with the muses. Sometimes the muses is not a beautiful lady, it's a huge man being. <laughs> that can beat you up easily. You grab him from the neck and bring him. Come on, man. You're going to work for me. The muses don't come to you. You come to the muses. You fight for the muses. This needs a lot of physical strength. Margarita, the very important French writer, say you have to be stronger than what you are writing. You have to be stronger. I was thinking, what happened to Francis Ford Coppola? Three of his films are among the ten more important films for me in the history of film. The Godfather 1, The Godfather 2, and Apocalypse Now. What happened to Francis Ford Coppola? Why he isn't able to make another masterpiece? Because he got tired. Because directing a film needs a lot of physicality. I was watching on the big screen The Godfather. The attention he put in every detail needs a man with a lot of strength. And he couldn't have that strength anymore. It's a pity because he's a genius. I love the man even, I had never even crossed a word with him, but I love him. But he doesn't have the strength. And we writers, we are terrified because we have only a gallon of him. And we run out of that gallery, I think. It's terrifying. What about if what I'm writing now is nonsense? What about if films I'm doing, no one cares about them? And it's a terrifying thing for someone like that. And someone like Hemingway. Hemingway was completely terrified of this. The man, the macho man, suddenly writing something like across the river. I don't even remember the title, that bad is the novel. And he knew it was bad. The problem is you know that it's bad. Imagine Mr. William Ford, the great writer of all times in the United States, I think, personal, or one of the greatest. He wrote the best of his work between the age of 30 and 40. And when you have maturity and you have experiences in life and you're supposed to give the best of you, nothing comes out. Terrifying. I say this to a group of writers, one of them was like, stop, 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 no more. <laughs> so, we have to be very careful in what we spend a good talent of time, of think. I try to be very careful in where I put that talent of think. That's why I refuse to, to write soap operas. That's why I refuse to write a commercial advertisement. I could have been rich with that. But I didn't want to, because I have this down thing. I'm an atheist. I do not believe in God. I do not believe in an afterlife. I believe in this life. That's why I try to be the best human being possible in this life. The other day I was reading an article in, I think it was the New York Times or the Times. Can atheists be moral? Wow. <laughs> like, we are immorals. <laughs> If we don't have someone watching us, we are immoral. Like Obama says, are you serious? Of course we are moral. We want to have the best of humans here in this, in this world. Right here we want to be the best. And being the best is being as generous as possible. As trying to bring the best of the other people. Sometimes I give away my secrets as a writer. And many people say, you are betraying. Us. I say, why? Because everyone can write. Good! Good. I don't want to keep nothing to myself. I want people to write better than me. I don't mind if someone of my students beats me up because he has my tricks and he wants the Nobel Prize and I don't. I will feel very happy. 
But the only way to present for me is creating something and trying to do the best I can. Well, this deer in the headlights wants to thank you. Thank you very much.